Hi, Ted Trishul. There he is. A big round of applause for him. He worked at the Alapi Medical College, Calicut Medical College, Trishul Medical College, Kerala before joining Westport High Tech Hospital Cardiology and was elevated to the post of director in 2002. Warm welcome, sir. I'd like to invite on stage Dr. Rajiv Gautam, President Hori Binder, which is the fastest growing hematology manufacturing company globally. Warm welcome, sir. He has invested more than 28 years in healthcare sector in India and has had a dynamic career. Warm welcome once again. And uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Girish Tyagi, President Delhi Medical Association and Registrar of Delhi Medical Council. He's the President of Delhi Medical Association, ladies and gentlemen. Let's welcome him on stage with a huge round of applause. He's had many avatars. Uh, he served the organization in the role of Secretary, Finance Secretary and Senior Vice President in DNA. So lots of uh, avatars there. Warm welcome to you, sir. And uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Nandita Palshekar, uh, who is President Foxy. There she is, one of the pioneers of IVF clinics in India, specializing in assistive reproductive technologies and has been instrumental in helping over 25,000 aspiring parents to have a baby of their own. Warm welcome, ma'am. And uh, uh, now, of course, I have to invite our chair and moderator. So I'm going to request uh, uh, Shubhankar from our team to quickly get us another chair. Uh, for the chair. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me take the privilege and the honor of introducing him. Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, Director IIHMR Delhi. Uh, he's a name New Delhi alumnus with 41 years of experience in public health across 29 countries. He then joined UNICEF and worked for 22 years as health specialist in India and as Chief of Child Survival and Development and Senior Advisor for 22 countries in Central Asia, Central and Eastern Europe and Baltic states. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, thank you for accepting to moderate and chair this session for us and it's all over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening. So it's a pleasure for me to moderate the discussion with such eminent speakers on it. Most of them have received international national awards. We have two Padam Bhushans in the panel. So if I go through the list, it will take a long, long time. What we will be looking at during this panel discussion is role of hospitals, how they can help in improving CME, I look at three components of CME. One, as a specialist, you need to know what is the latest happening in your specialty. But keep in mind that a specialist is defined as one who knows more and more about less and less. Nice. So that is the definition of specialist. Second, you need to know what is happening in the field of health overall so that you can connect your specialty to overall picture in health, including public health. Third, changes in health field are taking place more from changes and technology outside health field. So you need to keep an eye on what is happening outside the field of health, which is revolutionizing healthcare, of which we are all part of. And I often remember many of the experts say when you are graduating in, in medical school, within five years, 50% of what you have learned will become obsolete and wrong. Beauty is you don't know which 50%. So it's very important for us to keep in touch with what is happening in the three areas which I, I mentioned earlier. So with that introduction, uh, we can start with Dr. S. It's an honor to have you, sir, on your view on how hospitals can play an important role in CME. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, everyone wants to learn more. I remember my days, and uh, most of our students who go out and they are in practice, like in his hospital or somewhere, their only complaint is, sir, time me milta. Because there is so much demand from the hospital, from patients, and there are no residents generally who teach you more than you learn from books. So they end up, at the end of 
the best guys that I have who have paper with me in New England Journal, after three years, you realize their level with the current residents have gone down. This is just for the speciality, the brightest of the bright. One out of hundred may have an exception who will try to lit the lamp every day late night, but others will not. So can hospitals make that difference? My personal view is very limited. Unless the hospital has that attitude of accepting excellence, making these guys rewarded or incentivized for learning, there will be very little. Their only incentive from going to, from academics to the private is probably, moni probably monetary or more comfort or different way of living. So, to say for any given hospital, I would say for all hospitals in which we need and which is a practice in US is that private hospitals are academically also oriented, they strive for excellence. And with you being there, all the management schools, all the hospitals can have that. You have billboards, doctor so and so, so many specialities. Nobody says Thursday morning, 7 o'clock, New England Journal, this is what is published. Not one place in the country would have, except probably our place where you have all new journals coming online and people can walk through, clean through, like speaking walls. So, in my opinion, it is the attitude of the hospital owners, not the doctors, which will help them change their approach to CME. This is one point. Second, if you all can provide them free online access to their libraries, like e-libraries, at ILBS, every single employee, doctor, not that we are praising, or resident has an access to a few hundred journals free of cost. You just click on to our in-house and they all will get it. So provide free access to journals of their choice. You ask everybody like in an academic institute. Third, I think we need to tie up for CME for the peripherals and I am very happy Girish is here. And we had a hepatitis day two days ago and we had asked and he says, Sir, DMA is with you. And I'm sure DMA is with every CME. It's not only for hepatitis or liver, it is with every CME. So we need the associations, not the hospitals only, but the associations also to be proactive and clear that they are not only for elections or awards or for cheers, but they are also to make doctors wiser. So these are my few thoughts and uh, thank you for asking. Thank you, sir. You have highlighted the problem of having very little time uh, in a busy clinical schedule, but at the same time you highlighted by providing access to the latest scientific literature, access to the journal, and partnering with various associations, you can move in that direction. One issue Dr. Sarin raised is attitude of hospital owners. I think we are now moving on to a to a person who manages the Paris Hospital. So what are your views on that point and, and others? So substantially, uh, I completely agree with Dr. Sareen's points. But these are attitudes are not only important how owners behave, but how the system behaves. So Dr. Sareen mentioned the American context where they have academic medical centers. Uh, recently, this government has helped us by making DMD programs easily accessible. Until unless you have some academic input in the hospital, you won't have PJ. Individual doctors can learn themselves, teach themselves, attend CMEs and that, all that kind of stuff. But at the moment, hospital owners need to be encouraged and they are being encouraged by this government to take more and more DMDs. And our hospitals particularly have gone ahead and tried to get DMDs in each and every department. We are also doing one thing. that absolutely agree, doctors don't have the time, they're busy looking at the patients. Who will teach? I have instituted a plan that 
all our consultants who are involved with DNPs will get a special allowance just to teach. We will take care of that one hour they spend and we will put our money into it, help them teach the students. That will not go, they will not feel that as if they could have seen five patients and not wasted time. We are providing them financial leverage so that they can spend time on teaching the DLP students. So this is a very small, it's not very significant amount of money we're giving, but still, it's a way to encourage our doctors to keep teaching. Also, we need clinical leaders, and in our hospitals, we've had clinical leaders. Uh, I'll take an example, a friend of his, Dr. V.S. Mehta, who joined us from Ames. Since he's been with us for the last 12, 13 years, he still comes at 8 a.m. every day, and he makes sure there's a clinical round. Every th Thursday, there is an audit. He's He's followed the process, he hasn't compromised. He hasn't made the excuse that I'm very busy, so I won't study it, I won't study it. So I guess a lot of this is also the lead clinical leadership. They can decide their roadmap. Hospital owners can do two things. Encourage DNPs, encourage learning environment, and financially support our doctors to continue with this. And I think this is just a small thing we can do. Dr. Naga, we are not going to leave you so early. Dr. Sarin has a question for you. So, through you, all the hospital owners, if they agree to spend 2% of their revenue, 2% of the total revenue, not the profit, onto academics, I think things will change. So, do you agree to that? So 2% is a very stiff target sir has given us. <laughs> and I, 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 I completely agree that some sort of a fund needs to be created. And, and, <laughs> sir, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sir uh, government has a free land, they will have to do all the commitment. What is the sir, government? Is, yes. is decided. So we won't pin you down in public, but think about it. No, 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 absolutely. No, I won't be pinned down because I am not a politically correct person. <laughs> what has happened is, sir, that healthcare needs to go in the direction as sir is suggested. <clears throat> but the environment has to support it. Yes. There is a huge distrust between public and private today. Everybody thinks the other guy is a thief. And that means everybody is thinking the other guy is thief. Sometimes government thinks they, only, they are the only people who should consider other people's. It's not like that. If we want to provide health provision to healthcare, we want to reach the end user to the end user. It's important that hospitals, private hospitals, do make profit, but only reasonable profit. <coughs> And how do we support education? We should spend more. Half percent, I will take it. Half percent, my government, sir. With that, we have an eminent gynecologist who also happens to be president of Federation of Gynecological Society of India. So we heard from two of them engaging associations. So what are your views on? association in partnership with hospitals, what role they can play? I think I want to give you an example of what Foxy is actually doing. Uh, I agree with Dr. Sareen and Dr. Nagar that, uh, you know, the CMEs will educate, uh, we need clinical leaders. Also, what we have realized in Foxy is we have started a program called Manyata, which educates not only the doctors, but everybody, right from your receptionist to your paramedical staff to everybody. This is what we need to understand the value of CME. CME is not only for doctors, because your reflection is your whole team. The doctor is there for two minutes with the patient, but the entire team, the nursing, the paramedical staff is actually the one which interacts. And if they are not educated, they are not taught the systems, I think that becomes a very, very in integral part and that is what Foxy is doing. We have a project called Manyata which is quality uh, improvement and quality assurance. 
because the private sector is fragmented, there's difference in quality. We are talking about, the, I'm not talking about the corporates. I'm talking about the small nursing homes also. You know, corporates, because of your DNP, definitely, you know, you have, a, I work in Leelavati, and we have all our journal sessions, we have our CMEs, everything going on, which is fantastic. They have even for the nurses. But the smaller hospitals is where we need to energize. And this program has become successful when the owner of the hospital is committed to it. The whole team really energizes and that is what we actually see. And here, the CMEs are important, the digital CMEs. We have a platform called ECHO through which we actually uh, teach, you know, skilling is done uh, to many centers from one place. So I think uh, CMEs has an important role in healthcare all across, right from your receptionist to your doctor. It's very, very important. Thank you so much. And there is a message for you, Kamal Narayan, where are you hiding? <laughs> Yeah, the outside. <laughs> okay. You also conduct every year awards for CSR in health and related areas. It's very important for us to build CSR as an activity of the hospital to conduct CME. They, it's already, as per law, they have to do it. And recently I heard in the media that those who do not spend X amount of money will be penalized. It's so we actually got the CMS Council can bring the two together and then we can look at uh, how CSR initiative can include CSR. So actually we got an award for this CSR initiative, the Manyata. We okay. got an award for it. So we have it. Uh, have an example <laughs> as well. You can win an award for, for doing that. So we, we have heard about the Medical Council of India. In fact, it was Medical Council of India which included uh, fixed hours of CME. So with that, over to you to tell us about what uh, Medical Council of India is Well, uh, I'm representing both the Medical Assistant as well as the Medical Council. Because at the Medical Council, we are uh, dealing with the cases against the doctor for professional misconduct and negligence. And of course, uh, as far as the Medical Assistant is concerned, because issue of uh, just the uh, Nagar raised the issue about the viability of the reason. Now, at the moment, small nursing homes are at the verge of diminishing. Diminishing. I mean, uh, small clinics because of the family issues of family physician. Now, where are the family physician? Nowhere we are seeing the family physician. You just, at my, at my residential environment, for the last 25 years or so, there is no increase in the family physician. Family physician culture is being vanished which is more important that is because he knows the family vision, knows the practical history of that particular family and when he referring to the patient to a particular specialty or particular hospital then patient has a confidence in him. Now when a patient is going for that big hospital, he is going there with the vision that he will be being cheated, being looted and something and something. So, and Hospitals, which are of course uh, there, because their land is not being electricity, they are paying electricity at the commercial rate, water at the commercial rate, sewage at the commercial rate. Now, fire and is required. So, running a nursing home, as 32 inspectors are there, 32 with diff 32 different agencies, they have to get registered for running a nursing home. And every inspector means you have to bribe something to please him, maybe a police, police IO or sub-inspector, housedar, sentry inspector, fire inspector. So, so, running a hospital is a very, very difficult job at the moment. As far as the team is concerned, big hospitals as Dr. Serene, Dr. type of person Dr. Serene is, wherever he is, the academic atmosphere will be there because we know he practically reaches at his institute from 7 a.m. That means before anybody enters that hospital, he is there in the hospital and he leaves at the last. We know that. And uh, big round of applause for Dr. Sain for his commitment to the patient. <laughs> you go to the institute, you can find him available at the, for every patient. And as far as CME, at Delhi Medical Council, we are accrediting the CME. 
being housed by the hospital or the nursing home or uh, and we have decided that in every CMA, because routinely the CMA of course is going on, in every CMA we are, whichever CMA we are creating, it is it's a principle that you have to be conduct for 30 minutes talk on ethics, because in, in our times the, the number of complaints, we, we are seeing number of complaints against the doctors for their behavior, their communication, their documentation. These are the three things. Communication, document, we, we doctors are very poor in communicating as well as in documentation. And the cases filed by the, against the doctors, maybe at the Delhi Medical Council or Medical Council of India or Consumer Courts or Criminal Courts, the cases will be decided based on the evidence and evidence is in the form of the reports. At Delhi Medical Council, when uh, because uh, when the hearing is there, the, our decision committee is there, there are six members out of these six members, there are three members are the non medico and three are members are the med medico. Three non members are there, one MLA is there, one lawyer is there, one eminent public man is there. And some of the time it is seeing that doctor who has written the operative notes, he is not able to read his own OT notes. And that is in front of the lawyer and eminent public man and MLA. So, what reputation the doctor as well as uh, we are getting? We, and we are issuing the medical certificate, false medical certificate for uh, pleasing some month. Some month. So, so, small hospitals or big hospitals, academic atmosphere will be there. Wherever the DNB residents are there, of course, academic atmosphere will be there and the teaching will be there. So, small nursing homes should tie up with the big hospital for. We, whichever, say, suppose the six small nursing homes there with a 20 bed or 30 bed or less than 50 bed, there can be a big hospital of 100 to 200 bed where the uh, proper CME can be arranged. So the, these small nursing homes should be have a tie up with that nursing home so that whenever there is a CME going on at the big hospital, they, they can attend that CME at that particular hospital. As far as that, Digital theme is content, Omni, we have uh, tied up with the Omnicurus also and uh, we have asked Savita for the Omnicurus that in the, they, they, they are just add on this ethics issue on this uh, platform also because we know, we should know about the ethics, what are the ethics, how, for how many records, how many years we should maintain the records for the, the, regarding the communication, regarding the documentation, regarding the, when the patient asks for the record, how many days or I, we have to provide us the record. So these things should be there uh, in the, the CME platform as well as in the, and of course in the conventional CME we are discussing these kind of issues uh, with our members. Thank you Dr. Girish, you really highlighted the gap. The problems of running a hospital on day to day basis, including corruption around them and how they need to please and at times issue certificates which shouldn't be issued in the first place. And uh, you also talked about creating academic atmosphere and an area which is also often missed out communication and documentation. We have another eminent panelist who has been on various aspects of uh, medical care industry, okay. starting with pharma sector, then going to diagnostics and uh, uh, machine technology and so on. So with that, over to you, uh, Dr. Rajiv Gautam, to give us an idea about uh, how we can improve on uh, Thanks, sir. Let me give the perspective from the industry side in, inside the panel. Uh, let me change that slightly perspective to two points. One, what is the role of private uh, industry or industry into this CME for the hospitals or the diagnostics? And second thing is let me go from clinicians to pathologists. Because a pathologist cannot do, until a pathologist is not, and a clinician cannot do much, the pathologist is done. I think uh, Dr. Sreen made a very good point. What is the need for, for the clinician to do the CME? First, we have to find out what is the need for this. So I am, I belong to Hariba, and Hariba has done a, a, a program called CME, it's called HABX, Hariba. Uh, a hematologizer and analyzer exchange. Uh, let me give you what the need is. Today, 
there are 100,000 laboratories in this country. How many really, really know that, or they still, as you say, 50 people must have forgotten after five years? How many are following the rules? How many following the SOPs? And how many has a need inside them to go for CME or learning mode? They may, they may not have inside their to, to, to learn. So what we did, coming back to Dr. Sareen's point to make a research to connect to the research. So we have given them the platform that they get any special case or they see any things. So they wanted to publish. So there is a platform, they can come to that platform and we every year we run a this type of a meeting and then under the commissions and everything they get a platform. Suppose a lab in Najafgarh, okay, is running the samples in morning till evening. If we get a platform like this in once in a year, that's that's for which he wanted to learn more, he wanted to learn other things. So that is we have to create what is needed for us. And second point. I don't think that the clinician, uh, there is a connect between clinicians and pathologists in, in this country. A new test comes, until a clinician don't write, pathologists don't do it, but there is a commercial situation for this. So I think there is somewhere there is, has to be connect, CME has to connect clinicians and pathologists in this country. Otherwise it will, it will like two verticals, we are still doing ESR, uh, nothing against ESR, but but, but in this world we are still doing ESR. I don't know what we are doing ESR. Clinician is writing, pathologist is doing that ESR. So uh, there is no, no clinical significance of ESR, but I don't think there is any, anybody teaching that there is no, way, no, no significance of ESR. I think the connect between clinicians and uh, pathologists and a continued education and creating a ecosystem where Everybody thinks what is it for me. I think money is not the only thing that you have to give certain social platform to so they can get the recognition. The most important is the I was really fascinated by, to know that now 35% of the CME, at least in the United States, is done by the hospitals. I may not share the pessimism of Dr. Saril, but I think even in our country, the, the newer uh, newer laws also will mandate some CME programs. Now we were uh, hearing about, uh, earlier speaker Dr. Rao talking about the, the stent story. Uh, the, when, when the stenting came to India sometime in the uh, uh, late 80s, uh, uh, Professor um, Eri Mehta is here, and uh, he was one of the earlier people who started the innovation. The hospital started educating the, the, the newer generation. Cardiologists uh, do deal with a lot of innovative technology. And that has basically we have been learning it from the seniors in the attached hospital. Now, hospitals can have two types. You can have a targeted CMI, like uh, now teaching the newer innovation, or the one thing we have to be very, very, it's very clear is that interprofessional education is the only way to reduce the hospital cost, hospital readmissions. The hospital owners may not like it, but that's, that's the only way. We have to teach our, our own colleagues, our own staff nurses, our own population. So that is one thing. We, the, another part, the hospitals can very well do that. We have done done it in Kerala, in my state, Kerala. We learned it from the obstetricians. We have a program called Why Mothers Die in Kerala. See, every maternal death is audited. So, so we learned from them 60 of our hospitals in Kerala. Besides, of course, we had some funding. Yeah. We had a quality improvement program in heart attack care for the first time being done in India. We published that last year in JAMA. 22,000 patients and showed that. Now it's not a gimmick, it's simple things we can definitely improve the quality of the care. We did the same thing in heart failure. So hospital has a tremendous role and I think it's, it, it's increased day by day. And I, I'm not as pessimistic as you said. <laughs> I do agree, I 100% agree the proportion of uh, the roles of hospitals in India when compared to the West is uh, minuscule. 
<laughs> Thank you. We, we heard loud and clear that hospitals have a very important role uh, role to play. We have many experts in the audience, so we'll open it up for you to ask questions or comments. If you have a question to one of the panelists, please uh, name the panelist uh, to whom the question is addressed. If it is to the whole panel, then we will see who can, who is the best person to respond to that question. Sir. While we are waiting and in the interest of time, the way hospitals serve in conducting CMEs is that hospital gives some money and they call X number of doctors who are their referral doctors. Whether it is X hospital, Y hospital and let's say if my friend or colleague he is mandated to do a CME because the hospital has asked him so that 300 doctors come so that it's a referral, you please you are referring doctors. Now that has become the role in my mind and which I am very clear ethically is not a correct. So first thing is what we should not do. What we should do all of us are talking. But the hospitals should not engage in this manner that you only invite those who refer to you. So is that uh, something which all agree, then we should be ahead. The second part is that what uh, Dr. Girish said, and it is true, it is actually painful that there are no family physicians. Now many people, let's say Calcutta, Bombay, they come with a, and even Delhi, those who are rich guys, they bring a family physician. But you ask their level of knowledge, the only meant for bringing the the rich guys to the hospitals. But that's not what family physicians should be. And there is a need and the family medicine and in fact in the council when I was there we made a structure MBBS and then two years of master. And that master of that is uh, MD kind of a thing, that's not a three year course, that family physicians are there. But let's say we don't have that, then what do you do? I think we should have different levels of CMEs available for different types of people. And at that time, we had planned, and I'm very happy that need came in, and then the next, both were scripted in 2010. For the next, for going into PG and for passing need, there was one year of internship. And that internship had 550 diseases as modules, that like from snake bite to heart attack, everyone, 550 things you need to know. So what should be a CME? First, if we define, that should be your good medical MBBS, but after two years, five years, what is a good CME? So we should define that, maybe in a structure that you have or the associations have, that this is a good CME, this everyone knows, this is advanced, recent advanced, this is a skill, this is that. So I think it will be worthwhile that people like you and whoever define in a given subject or a broad subject what is a good CMA. It's not that you get speakers and people of your choice. Third, and I, without humil all humility, without exaggeration, we started that people should not refer patients to ILBS. Isn't it anti-climax? And the whole idea was, can we have hepatology, liver specialty in every medical college? And today, I am very happy, 110 medical colleges, every fortnight we have four hour session. And people are registered, faculty members, medicine, surgery, pediatrics. We have almost 700 doctors and we certify them at the end of one year. The whole, and it's a case-based CME, it's not a didactic lecture. You have a case which is difficult, pregnancy, liver failure. How do you manage it? Another patient who has a liver cancer which has gone into the portal vein, how do you manage that? So the whole idea is don't come, 99, 95% of things you can handle it. So that is a CME which I think is required and at the end of one year you say you are let's say hepatitis proficient doctor. I'm not saying it's a certificate, but at least you are proficient, efficient in handling these patients. One more small point is, 
Incentives are always not the best way. Sometimes punishment, sometimes a hard-hitting danda is also required. So I have two more suggestions before I give it to the chair. Half percent, they have agreed that the owners of the hospitals will pay for academic. Another half percent, pharma. If you make half percent of the pharma revenue, of all Indian pharma revenues, the CME, that makes one percent. And their revenue is not less, their revenue is not less. Now that one percent can be hugely channelized by association. I need money, my quality of CME is tested by somebody. I need 20 lakhs and I don't have to go to pharma. It's a pooled money of all the pharma. It's a pooled money of all the hospitals. So that makes 10,000 crores. Of that, I can ask for money and that money I can use based on the quality of CME I create. In the US, they have generally money. Let's say I have a $700 for my registration. It's waived off the department or the funds. But in our place, the registration for CME is 15,000. I can't pay that 15,000. I lost support from X Pharma, X Fund. If we remove that part and make it revenue neutral, it is not by the amount of money or the amount of pharma's interest with me. I think the culture of CME. So what I want to emphasize, the quality of CME, pooled money, and I think we should have different levels of CME. And this debate, I'm very happy, it is making me think and making me feel more involved into this. If this meeting can make a cultural change in the doctors. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nandik, and we have a few hands going up in the audience. After your comment, we will take the comment from you. So what I really feel strongly about is consistency of teaching. I think if a student is, uh, you know, is listening to the CME in, say, Delhi and in Trivandrum, causes of fever, or what is the diet, what are the tests, he should be taught one, two, three, four, which is same all over. Then the super speciality, I think we don't have consistency in our education. So our education needs to be uh, same all over and that will make a difference because as a family physician I learned four things. As a super specialist let me learn 16 things. We come out of MBBS not really knowing the, the actual things. So maybe you know we need a radical change and the CMEs that we cut across for undergraduates, for postgraduates and keep this as a kind of a module online even for practitioners to have a look at it and to learn consistency. Thank you. Dr. Girish, as I comment, then we go to the audience. Just to add on to Dr. Sarin's comment that hospital organizing us any calling for that uh, persons who have referring the business. In addition to that, I just want to add, even the quacks, non-qualified persons are asked in these CME. Regarding just to leave about that hospital, yeah, even that medical assistant annual conferences, we have noticed that quacks being asked to come to attend that CME just to please them. And of course, in the night CME, because the culture of our conventional CME is that night CME means that Daru should be there, drink should be there. They, they are coming for the drink and the non veg. And uh, routinely, and their number, when the doctor came for the CME, when the practical scene is going to end and dinner is going to start. So we have to shut, cut short this kind of culture if the content is good, as Dr. Sarin is saying. If the content is good, even the doctor is able to pay that CME. Not that he will, we just to have a free CME and ask him for that matter to come for the dine and dinner for that. So can we move on to the audience? Yes, uh, sorry, sir, you have been waiting for quite so, some time. I am Ashok Jayurari. I am head of pediatrics at Ames New Delhi. My question is to Dr. Sarin. Sir, do you think our future generation of doctors need to be taught management principles? They need to be taught about the processes and how to improve the outcome and how to embed quality health care in the health system? Excellent uh, question and uh, it brings me fond memories when I was at Yale 
In 1988, there was a hepatitis conference in uh, uh, Florida. It was a day and a half on hepatitis B. One day was for doctors. One day was doctors with lawyers. So that doctors can protect themselves. And I was surprised why lawyers and doctors are sitting together. That was like 40 years ago. Recently, I have visited some of these uh, major conferences. Like, if there was a meeting in uh, uh, Mount Sinai on innovations, they have an incubator and innovation concept. All these were CMEs kind of things, but they were management, they were people who were learning from innovations. Now, what you are talking is multidisciplinary. Should doctors be trained in hospital operations or should doctors training program include? I think doctors, they learn X from the school. They learn Y from the patients. But the Z is left. And that Z is all which is to be known. And I think like AIMS is run very well, Shakti and others are there, so they are operations people, hospital. But most hospitals are run by doctors who have never been trained. I think management training, behavioral training, and of course an attitude towards responsiveness to patients. All these are parts which we in our journey must learn. But I want to go beyond that. That is a must. Beyond that is what doctors should learn is actually an inquisitiveness, an approach to learning more every day with society and others. And one more a small point is there has to be somebody. I'll give you an example. Two days ago, one of the most difficult cases was done by one of our colleagues. And the patient developed a complication 3 o'clock in the morning. It was since the patient was managed. The patient is better, but no one was there from 4 o'clock till 6.30 to talk to the relatives. And I get a call. I was so pained. I said, you're managing the patient, but somebody should manage this. We are trying to teach everybody, but the priority then becomes the patient and his life. Of course, but for those guys who have come all the way from down south, it is immaterial. What is important? Ya ho kya ra, ya bache ga, nahi bache ga, kya ho. So that part is, like you said, in communications is not there. Grief counseling, you have in army or in military, rapid action force. We don't have a rapid action force to handle these so-called problems. And I think uh, these are not CME, these are operations matter. You know it better than and I am sure Dharmen will know it. <laughs> Thank you. Any any other comment or suggestion? Thank Dr. Ashok Devrari for that insightful uh, question. Anyone else from the audience? All right. I wanted to see what will be covered. There were some areas I had noted down which were not covered by the panelists. I would like to add to that. Focus on enhancing quality of care. Recent data shows more people die in India of poor quality of care then because of lack of access to care. So let's keep that in mind. The focus needs to be on quality of care in whatever we do. Second is there are a lot of advances in medical care which are taking place because of technology. CME needs to keep all of us informed on what is happening in technology two years from now. For example, I read in our abstract of a paper, you before you get a myocardial infarction, six weeks before that you get a substance in your blood which is in very minute amount in picogram. If it can be picked up, you can take action before the MI takes place. So a lot of things are happening. We need to know what is happening in the field of technology which is going to revolutionize healthcare. You are going into having virtual hospital. 
they will be monitored, people sitting on the panel will be wearing maybe an armband and somebody sitting there will be monitoring and maybe call one of our dogs and give one what happened, your BP shot up, I said, oh my god, I forgot to take my antihypertensive in the morning. So, you know, you don't need to go to hospital and that is going to happen sooner than later. So, technology is, is something which is going to revolutionize and CME has to take care. The third point I had noted down is continuum of care. We have had two tragedies in the country. One is Muzaffarpur and before that still fresh in our mind is Gorakhpur. These children die because they reached the tertiary level care, the hospital where many of our panelists work, very late, they didn't have primary health care. Simple thing like 10% glucose could have been given and these lives could have been saved. So CMA in the hospital should take care of strengthening primary health care so that the patients who reach hospital don't reach very late. By that time you cannot do anything even in the best of hands. So these were the three points I wanted to add. But let's look at effectiveness of human resources for health. It has four elements. One is number, everybody talks about so many vacancies, so many specialists are not there. Second is skill. Those who are there, do they have the right skill? Not in most of the cases. The third is, do they have access to all the supplies they need to provide that care in which they have skills and then you have adequate number. Fourth is the work environment which you provide in the hospital. And, uh, focus on excellence and so on. So these were a few points which I thought we needed to highlight and we had missed out in the panel discussion. So uh, you want to say on the continuum of care and quality, I am reminded of a famous uh, book, The Checkpoint. I'm sure many of you, Rajiv, would have read The Checkpoint. And this is uh, an amazing book and I want uh, many of you who are from management to know about this story. So there was a young girl this is a real story published in the International Journal of Thoracic Surgery in 2005 in a small town about 200 miles away from Austria, from the capital. So in the winter night, this girl was walking with her parents and she fell down into a pit which was about 20 meters down. And they couldn't see, they had no time. So they called on cell phone, the helicopter came in about six or seven minutes. She was picked up, taken to the nearby small town hospital. She was blue and pulseless. They made her ventilated. They did everything, then they realized that her uh, lung is not heavy. So they put her on ECMO. Then they realized she is not opening her eyes. They did a CT, took out the blood clot. And lo and behold, this girl who was brought blue with no pulse, no oxygen, she went home after two weeks. Somebody asked, how could this, in a small town, you can't do it in Delhi, how could she survive? So the intensive care people said, we had a checklist of 166 things to be done in the emergency and we did 162 correctly, so she survived. All 166 were listed and she survived. So the phenomenon of checkpoint is so important that you know what to do and if you do it, this will be the result. If you don't do, this will be the result. So I think the quality of care and, and that's what CME should do. At the end of it, you know if I do this, this will happen. If I don't do this, this may happen. So, just a story I remembered and I thought it might help. Thank you. We have immense knowledge and experience on this side of the panel. But unfortunately, the time is a constraint, so we will have to close. We have broadly discussed four areas from the panel. One is the content of CME. We need to define what has to be content of the training, needs to be standardized. So wherever you do training, those areas will be 
will be covered. Second is very important why we did not talk about it earlier in the previous session is funding. Where do you get those? Thank you, Dr. Sarin. He pinned down two of the panelists and we looked at getting huge amount of money for uh, for CME. So that will take care of funding. And we will we will hold you accountable. <laughs> the third area is facilitation by administration. Dr. Nagar gave a very good insight what role administration can play in this hospital to, to facilitate. And sports is highlighted by many panelists, especially by Dr. Sarin, is strive for excellence in your day-to-day -day work. That itself will be a very good CME. Any doctor who visits a particular specialist hospital will take back the, mess back the message that you have to continue striving for excellence in whatever you do. Your skill should dem be demonstrated in what you do on daily basis. Thank you so much and thanks to all the panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, and thank you uh, to the esteemed panelists. I'd like to, in the interest of time, uh, gentlemen, we have the minister who's approaching the venue. So we will have the conversation taken offline, please, sir. So may I request you, sir? Without eagerness, deep involvement, and self-motivation. All right, thank you very much, sir. We can also take the conversation. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to request Ms. Savita Kutan, CEO OmniTurist, to kindly join us on stage and uh, thank our esteemed panelists. And if we can start from the right hand side, uh, before the picture, of course, uh, can you please have the mentor photographers? You'll have to wait a little bit. And uh, I'd like to request you, ma'am, to first present to Professor S. K. Sarin, Director, Institute of Liberal and Religious Sciences. Can we have a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Dr. Dharminder Nagar, MD Paras Healthcare, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Professor S.K. Sarin, Director IMBS. Big hand to Dr. Nandita Palshikar, President of Foxy. Thank you for the applause. Can we have a loud round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. And to our moderator and chair, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, Director, IIHMR Delhi. Thank you for the applause, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Girish Tyagi, President of Delhi Medical Association and Registrar Delhi Medical Council. Dr. P.P. Mohanan, HOG Cardiology, Westport High Tech Fisher. Thank you, sir. And can we have a big round of applause for Dr. Rajiv Gautam, President Hariba. A big round of applause. And with that, please give us a photo opportunity. Ms. Kutan, a request to please be a part of that group picture. And the photographers can now take a group picture of our eminent, very eminent panelists. And that's a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So we're going to be proceeding to the award ceremony shortly. But